Psychology, Kunga Shirab from Buddhism, Psychology, and Mental Health, and Huda Hassan from African Studies. And um, one last reminder that this meeting is being recorded. Feel free to leave questions in the chat as the speakers are speaking, and uh, all the speakers will have 20 minutes to present and then a few minutes for questions after. So we'll turn it over to Colleen to introduce our first senior doctoral fellow today. Okay, thank you so much for having us. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce New College's Human Biology Senior Doctoral Fellow, who is Jonathan Chio. Jonathan just defended his PhD thesis on May 3rd, and so now he's Dr. Jonathan Chio. He, uh, his PhD thesis was based on the research in the lab of Dr. Michael Failings, who's at Toronto Western Hospital. And during his PhD, and probably in the last few weeks where he's been told what edits to make and what to tidy up before he goes, he's been working on translational research, and mostly in rats, I think, in order to investigate uh, mechanisms and treatment of spinal cord repair following injury. Today, he's gonna to divide his talk into two parts. The first part, he's gonna talk about his research, and in part two, he's gonna reflect on his graduate school journey, which I look forward to listening to. So go ahead, John, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Doc Sater, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so there's no need to call me doctor because I am still as naive as a, a grad student on my first day. So <laughs> there's no need to uh, call me that. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Let me, oops, let me see if it works. Okay. And, and, and John, I'm going to try and politely give you a five minute warning or a two minute warning or something like that. Okay. Okay. No. Are you able to see the slide that I'm sharing? Yes. Uh, maybe change it to, there you go. Perfect. Okay. So thank you. Uh, so as Dr. Dr. said earlier, I'm Jonathan. I am now a PhD graduate. Um, I defended in early of May, 2021. And so today I'm very happy to give my uh, presentation on my research over the past seven years. Um, but I know that because the audience that I'm talking to is not all in the, I'll say the hard sciences. And so to make the talk more accessible, I'll first be discussing my research and then um, discussing the reflections on my, my graduate school career because that might be a more um, appropriate topic because uh, I'm guessing the attendees here, um, the students are interested in, in potentially pursuing a, a grad school. So that's why I'm dividing my talk into the, those two parts. And so the first part of my talk will be on, on my research. So the clinical translation of IVIG or intravenous human immunoglobulin G is a treatment for traumatic cervical spinal cord injury. Okay, so the uniqueness of my research is that um, I'm able to take a drug that is currently um, already in clinic and being able to repurpose it uh, to treat a separate uh, disorder and a condition and therefore to, to build a, uh, a promising case. So I'm able to eventually, hopefully, uh, use this drug in the clinic to treat patients with an injury in their spine. And so um, as a brief background of what my injury model is, so I look at the SCI or spinal cord injury, uh, which is a biphasic injury, in which, as you can see here, there is the initial trauma on the cord that is made more severe by secondary injury cascades, with neuroinflammation playing a key role. Now, neuroinflammation is defined as the entry of immune cells going into the cord um, due to in part of a damaged BSCB, or blood spinal cord barrier for short. And now these immune cells are both beneficial and harmful. Uh, beneficial as they are able to uh, remove the cell debris and also secrete factors to enhance repair and growth, but harmful because their prolonged presence can also lead to the extra damage in the cord as well. And so currently, to treat patients with, uh, an, with SCI, we will administer to them powerful immunosuppressive drugs such as methylprednisolone that will dampen both the positive and the negative attributes. However, again, to ideally only shut down the negative and allow the positive attributes to flourish, therefore, it might, it might be more effective if we are able to administer therapies able to modulate and not uh, suppress the entire immune response after injury. And so an example of a immunomodulatory agent is IVIG or intravenous human immunoglobulin G. 
in which in my lab, we published that in 2012, the IVIG given at the dose of 0.4 grams per kg at 60 minutes post-injury is able to achieve immune modulation and also both short and long-term benefits post-injury. However, uh, we have to answer three main questions in order uh, to promote IVIG as a therapy for SCI. And so I, I want to answer three main questions. First, how does IVIG work? Second, what is the best IVIG dose to use for SCI therapy? And third, how long after SCI can I administer this best dose and be effective in treating my animals after injury? Uh, and so today I will show you that IVIG works in two ways by being able to limit the infiltration of immune cells, namely the neutrophils going into the cord and also to redirect them to go instead towards the spleen. The best IVIG dose to use is 2G per kg, and it will be effective if administered up until four hours post-injury. And so to answer my research questions, I use a clinically relevant rat model of injury, whereby I use the female adult Worcester rats, um, and I could do an injury as a uh, clip compression, where I damage the cord at the level of a C7 T1 or cervical level seven thoracic level one with a 35 gram clip. I would then administer IVIG at the different doses um, and, and or the different time points. And I'll keep my animals for the two time points acutely at 24 hours and chronically at the uh, six to eight weeks post injury. And so first of all, let's identify aim one or question one, which is how does IVIG work? So first I show that, um, so here we see uh, pictures of the immunohistochemistry, where I show that IVIG in red is able to uh, colloquialize with the different, um, and with the different ligands are able to allow the immune cells to enter into the cord. And in particular, these ligands include a VCAM1, ICAM1, and the PCAM1. And so what this means is that after administering IVIG, um, by being able to antagonize and therefore inhibit the, the interactions between the immune cells and the ligands, it is able to inhibit their entry into the cord and therefore reduce the inflammation occurring in the cord after injury. So also I show that after administering IVIG, uh, there, is a, there, there is a large um, reduction in the number of the neutrophils or, and the immune cells in the blood but there is a corresponding increase in the number of the neutrophils within the spleen. And because there is a corresponding increase and decrease of the neutrophils in the blood and the spleen respectively, this can potentially indicate that after administering IVIG, there is a potential mechanism involved in trafficking and also uh, trying, to, uh, trying, to, trying to, uh, to alter the migration or the travels of the immune cells elsewhere in the body. And I show that after administering IVIG, that this is indeed the case, as there is a upregulation or a higher expression of the two chemoattractants. So these are the signals that would uh, direct the neutrophil entry, namely the MYP1 alpha and also MCP1. And so in more layman terms, it means that after administering IVIG, not only am I able to inhibit the entry of the neutrophils away from the cord, and rather through the MCP1 and MIP1 alpha, be able to redirect them to go towards the spleen and therefore reduce the amount of injury in the cord afterwards. And so now that we identify how IVIG works, let's identify the best IVIG dose for SAI therapy. So here, um, so to answer this question, I'll be administering a different IVIG dose um, between 0.02 towards 2G per kg only at the 15 minutes post-injury and again, I will have the same two time points, acute at 24 hours, and chronically at the six weeks post-injury. So first I show that after administering IVIG, again, my human immunoglobin G in red is able to colloquialize with the, or overlap with the different uh, cells within the rat cord. And these cells include the, the blood vessels, astrocytes, and the parasites. And this is very important because these three cells will form what is known as the NBU or the neurovascular unit, whose function is to be able to maintain the integrity of the BSCB. And the integrity of the BSCB, it will depend on a, on a variety of factors, one of which is the balance in the expression between the tight junctions and enzymes that can degrade those tight junctions. And after SCI, it is beneficial to have a higher expression of the tight junctions because we will have a stronger barrier and therefore less immune cells entering 
into the cord and thus have less inflammation occur in the cord after injury. So here I show that um, after administering IVIG, there is a dose-dependent increase in the expression of the tight junctions, namely occludin and ZO1, and a decrease in the expression of NMP9, which can again degrade those, uh, those tight junctions. And so what this means is that after administering IVIG, I'm able to have a stronger or a less porous barrier, namely by increasing the ZO1 and the expression and decreasing NMP9 expression, which can again degrade those tight junctions. Also, I, I, observe, I observe that there is a dose-dependent decrease in the, uh, in the amount of the neutrophils in the cord, as seen with the MPO assay. So again, after administering IVIG, there is a stronger BSCB, and therefore less amount of the neutrophils in the cord after injury. If we fast forward to the long term or the six weeks post injury, I also observed the benefits as well, as observed uh, with the different um, neurobehavioral assays, namely with the grip strength. So my rats have a have improved um, foreland function. With the BBB, better handling function, so my rats can walk um, better. And also uh, on the inclined plane, better core um, strength. And, and associated with these um, motor behavioral recovery is also the fact that we have a better tissue um, preservation, as seen with the higher volume of both the cord gray and white matter, and reduced volume of the lesion and cavity. So the tissue overall is of a better quality after SAI and after IVIG treatment, especially at the high dose of 2G per kg. So now having identified the best dose and also how IVIG works, let's identify the time point to administer this best dose to be effective as SAI therapy. So here, um, for, for my third question, I will be uh, administering only the IVIG at the high dose um, at the 15 minutes, one hour, or four hours post-injury. And again, uh, keeping the same two time points acutely at 24 hours and chronically at the eight weeks to assess how IVIG is able to influence SCI um, uh, 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 pathology afterwards. So here I, I expand on my uh, previous findings where I showed that after administering IVIG in, a, in a, a delayed fashion, I also have a better BSCB as seen with a higher expression of the occluded and so on and lower expression of MMP9, which can again degrade those tight junctions. Associated with this improved BSCB is also the fact that we have a lower amount of the neutrophils in the cord. So after their delay IVIG administration, stronger BSCB, lower amount of the neutrophils in the cord after injury. If we fast forward to now eight weeks post injury, I also observe similar benefits in which I, there is the improved neurobehavioral recovery, so with the grip strength, better foreland function, a BBB, better highland function, and also inclined plane, better core strength. And if we look at the tissue quality, higher volumes of both the gray and white matter, and reduced lesion and cavity after F SCI and after IVIG 2G per kg delayed administration. So overall, what have I shown uh, over the past 10 minutes? Well, first I showed that after SCI, uh, the neuroinflammation is, is normally associated with the subpart outcomes at both the short-term and long-term um, time points post-injury. However, if I'm able to administer IVIG now at the high dose, at the 2G uh, per kg, up to four hours post-injury, I'm able to uh, reduce the entry of the neutrophils in the cord at the, uh, the short-term time point, improve the BSCB integrity, and be able to traffic the immune cells to go towards the spleen. This, at the long term, is able to, uh, is able to improve uh, both the tissue and also behavioral recovery after SCI. And so uh, overall, by identifying these three questions, I'm able to, uh, to make a better or a more concrete case to convince others that IVIG um, is a clinically relevant therapy to treat SCI in the future. So if you want to know more about my research, uh, so these are my papers I have been able to publish as part of my uh, PhD uh, thesis. So uh, feel free to have a read, and, and, and I promise you they are very interesting to read, although I, I am a little uh, biased in that regard. Um, but have a read uh, and email me if you have additional questions about them. Okay. Just uh, a five, five minute warning, okay, John? Okay. Oh, wow, that was quick. Um, and so I guess, in and so thank you for my, 
my lab mate uh, for their uh, for their help on my project. And so, as a quick five minute uh, reflection of my uh, graduate school career, uh, so this is going to be a very um, summarize a reflection of what I thought my past seven year was. So I began, um, so I began in 2014, where I began as a graduate student. Um, and then I was able to do my research uh, in, as a master's student. And then in the July of 2016, I entered into the PhD program. And through that, I was able to balance both uh, doing, my, doing my research and also uh, various um, academic uh, curricular activities to um, ensure that there is a balance between my research so I will uh, stay sane um, in the lab. And so uh, what is the pro of being a grad student? Well, there are a, a, there are a, a lot of uh, the uh, benefits. So you're able to be intellectually stimulated. You can enhance your uh, problem solving skills. And also uh, you have a lot of the uh, uh, freedom in how to uh, pursue your, your uh, research. However, uh, for the cons, is that there are the long hours, you deal a lot with the failure, uh, there is a pressure to publish, and also having uh, tunnel vision. And so it really is a balance of both to be able to stay sane and therefore uh, be successful in grad school. And so if I was to, con if, if I was to advise myself um, back then on how to be uh, better in grad school and how to be able to strengthen my application for grad school or other uh, um, professional programs, it is to be able to emphasize on both my, my uh, academic along with my personal strengths. And so, and also it is to envision um, how the admissions uh, members are, are able to view you as a candidate. Or in other words, I think about how, like what traits that they will see in others. Um, so that they'll be able to uh, select you to be part of their program. And so this includes, uh, what, what would you care about? Um, what would you, uh, what, what would you want to see? And also, um, how would you be able to, what would you do to make your case stronger to, so that they will choose you and not another, another person? Are you a leader? Are you a creative, able to overcome problems and being a team player? All of these skills are the traits that should be um, emphasized when you're applying to these um, graduate school programs because they are more of the independent and also working as a team as well. And so um, what I will tell myself uh, now is to be able to ditch the checklist and rather be able to have a um a, a more a personal narrative because that is that is able to um to really show your color and really able to show your um, personality through and not uh, and not just be one of the many uh, applicants uh, applying to that program and so by being able to really um show off your color and and even in your a personal statement you're able to to have to leave a more memorable impression so that you'll be more attractive uh, on paper and so they'll be able to invite you to an, an interview afterwards. And so maybe during your, your narrative, it is to, it is to, to, to describe why do you want to um, attend a grad school? Why are you a fit for the program? And also, um, how do you add a, a diversity into the, into the program and make them better? And in turn, make yourself better as well. And so it is to be able to focus on both the academic along with the personal uh, development. And so by being able to, uh, to balance both, you're, you're able to uh, reduce burnout and therefore be able to, uh, to maintain more longevity and also more endurance in your, uh, in your uh, graduate school career. And so here is how I was able to, to evolve, where in my first year I was doing a lot, I was unorganized and, and, and I was uh, burnt out. However, uh, by using a more a narrative, uh, a focus on both the academic and the social parts, I'm able to, uh, to be able to uh, tailor my, my schedule a lot better. So I'm able to both balance both my research along with my extra uh, curriculars. And doing that by being able to, uh, to reduce a burnout and therefore be more uh, fresh when I go to, into the lab uh, the next day to do more experiments and more uh, work afterwards. And so if there was anything that you can uh, t uh, take away from this talk, it is to ask yourself these three questions. What values will drive you? And what can you do reasonably uh, to, to balance both your academics and your extra uh, curriculars? And now that you have, have identified a goal, it is to identify what can you do in between to get there in the long run. And so uh, my email is here um, you, and feel free to, to uh, email me 
uh, at me on LinkedIn, and we're going to talk more about it offline. I believe I am now going over time. Um, so <laughs> thank you all for listening and look forward to answering your questions. John, that was excellent. And I first want to start off by saying I, I apologize for ever doubting that you could get through 117 slides in 20 minutes. So you've done it. I'm sure it's a world record. And oh that was excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and I appreciate that you added the extra part about more broadly about speaking about your graduate school experience too. So we have time. We have eight minutes for questions. Anyone have any questions? Ashley? Yeah, nice talk, Jonathan. Just, I just wondered if you could comment a little bit uh, on the kind of similarities and differences there might be between the, the rat and human. I know, for example, that response to inflammation in mice is quite different than in humans. And just in terms of translating your work to humans, just some comments on that would be great. This brings back uh, memories of my uh, defense. <laughs> And I say that in the back. Sorry about that. I'm not an expert. I don't know the answer. So no, no, it's okay. I I thank you for, uh, for your question. Um, so in terms of the translation uh, or how similar my rat model is, so um, for those who are not aware, um, in my field, um, we use both a rat and the mouse model. However, um, I use the rat model in my injury because the if you compare after the injury in the core between a rat and a human, it is a lot more similar in the injury um, of, uh, advancement. However, um, if you want to be able to target more about the, the genes or like the, um, the and, and more layman, it's like the, the stuff that occurs upstream to the proteins, like the genes, the, the uh, DNA stuff, uh, it would be better to use uh, the mouse model because the mouse is a lot more established in the sciences about their uh, genome. So both models are strong. But in terms of the clinical translation, the rat is, is a bit more uh, a, a superior, and that was why I used that model instead. Thank you. No worries. Other questions? So along the same lines, John, has any, have you or anyone in your lab looked at the differences in aging or development on this because not everyone's going to get a spinal cord injury as an adult. Yep. I assume there's, I know nothing about the spinal cord, but I assume there's still more plasticity in the spinal cord during development. And yep. then the aging process might actually inhibit some of these therapeutic effects. Yeah. Maybe in the older rat. So has anyone looked at the effects of development or aging on these types of treatments? For sure. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, so yes, yeah, so it, and if it, if you compare between the rats, like in the neo, uh, in the neo, like the AP zero, which is like a rat like born like right afterwards, compared to a more senior rat, like an older rat, um, and if you damage other cord, somehow the baby rats are they improve a lot better. Like there is almost no scar tissue being formed in their uh, baby or a more immature tissue. But if, if you compare that towards a more um, older rat, they have, they re will recover a lot slower. And we're not sure exactly why, um, the, why the young rats are, uh, they will recover a lot better. Um, one key thing is that it is that they are more uh, plastic. So by plastic uh, to in the more, Later, it is that like the brain or the tissue is able to adapt a lot better and therefore be able to overcome a, a lot more obstacles uh, to, to uh, recover better. And then as you age, you lose that, you lose that plastic edge, I'll say. You're, you're less adaptable, less flexible, and therefore you will recover uh, less optimally compared to a younger mouse. So, or a rat. So that's why we are trying to, uh, to try to like be able to revert back the clock. So by being able to, to add in a, a different factors, different molecules, we're, we're able to, and it is to make a older rat young again. And, we, and that has been shown that, the, that in that case, the rat, they do recover better afterwards. So we do know that age has a impact. We're just not exactly sure how and why yet. Thank you very much. We have time for a, one quick one, one quick question. So just, you might've said this, 
and I apologize if you did, but you, you, your research is on repurposing. And mm -hmm. so that means that the drug is already approved for something else. So just out of curiosity, what, what is your drug typically used for? Uh, my drug is typically used for, um, so other disorder is like in, in um, MS or where, or MS is short for the multiple sclerosis or, mm -hmm. or others where we have a autoimmune or where the immune system is actually um, fighting itself. Mm -hmm. Like uh, for example, the, uh, the Kawasaki disease. And okay. so by being a, so for those who don't know is that, so it, it, in order to like, to like um, really promote the, a drug from the bench towards the bedside, we have to go through a lot of hoops, like um, a lot of uh, red tape testing. Um, it's like the, uh, on the uh, ongoing um, the, uh, vaccine trials. And so therefore, if we're able to use a therapy or that is currently that is already used in humans elsewhere, we're able to take a lot of the, um, a wiser shortcut of being able to jump through less hoops and therefore be able to achieve the same goal at the end, which is to be able to develop a new therapy to, uh, to increase the patient's uh, quality of life afterwards. John, that was excellent. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, so our next speaker is um, uh, Kempo Kunga Sharam from Buddhism Psychology and Mental Health, who is going to be here talking about his work, identifying the enlightened minds of children between the 13th, 15th century in Tibet. I'll turn it over to you, Kempo. It's not working. Okay, can you see me? Yep, everything looks good. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, good evening, everyone. So before I present my paper, I would like to thank the member of New College for giving me this wonderful opportunity and suffer for my ongoing research. So it is an honor to share some of my research paper and to be part of this event. So you can see title of my presentation is identifying the enlightened mind of children in 13th and 15th century Tibet. So <clears throat> uh, beginning in the 13th century, a Tibetan Buddhist community began to identify the incarnation of their dead master in the body of newborn children. This is called Turgu in Tibetan language. So generation by generation, new practice of identifying such a special children increase. This including careful examination of infant behavior of dream and natural signs, and the experience of parent and close family member. So over time, so local tradition of identifying the mind of the children and develop in the 13th and 14th century and become an important way of reproducing Buddhist monastic community in inner Asia. So the Turku tradition first established in the Uisang, which is central Tibet, and then spread within Tibet, which is Kham and Amdo. And basically, whole Tibet will divide three parts, you can see here. So after 800 years, Tuku are found across the Himalayan and Inner Asian. You can find in Sikkim, Bhutan, Mongolia, Russia, Taiwan, China, Hong Kong, 
and beyond even you can find uh, Europe and North America. So today there are thousands such uh, incarnation lineage. You know, the institution of Dalai Lama is the best known example. So here, so research into the, this incarnation lineage is very important to understood, understand how Tibetan Buddhism spread into the neighboring country and how Tibetan Buddhists become connected to politics and economic. So that's the main my urging here. So you can see this, my bachelor's dissertation chapter. So I have come to my dissertation projects so basically the best on my kind of own personal experience. So maybe I can talk a little bit myself, you know, I was born in Tibet to a Buddhist family and grew up in a culture center around the Tulgu. So from the, from the time that I was a young boy, I spent much time with Oracle, Tulgu and other kind of, you know, religious authority that I explore in my dissertation. I was ordained as a monk in Tibet and enter into a monastery wall organized around the present of Tulgu. So when I was 70 years old, uh, I escaped Tibet by walking to Nepal and as a refugee in Nepal and then in India, I joined the Tibetan refugee diaspora community, you know, as a monk and study at one of the best uh, Buddhist university. In time, I came to the United States to study English and eventually joined the Tibetan refugee community in Canada as a refugee and become a citizen. So I have therefore grown up in the culture very focused on Tulku. So my dissertation I tried to understand how this becomes so by focus on the history of practice to identify these special children. In particular, my dissertation look at the practice of develop to identify Tulgu over the five major period between the 13th century and 20th century. So during this period, the Tulgu institution grew from a local tradition to an international one. And during each period of growth, new practice were developed to identify children as a Tulgu. So my dissertation count 14 different types of practices, including dream analysis and divination and public examination of several candidates and so on. So for my presentation today, I will introduce the earliest example of this kind of identification in the 13th to 15th century. So I will focus on practice used to identify the first Tulgu, a boy who would become the Tharkamaba, and also the first Samdhi Tojipamo, who was Tibetan's earliest female Tulgu. So that's like in two, maybe uh, give a more detail. So during the first 350 years of the Tulgu tradition in Tibet, only a handful incarnation lineage exists. So my research shows that practice used to identify them were mostly based on self-statement by the children and also local witness by family and regional religious uh, figure. This not like a, not long distant divination or privacy or other forms of investigation by non-local figure. So that's first Tulku's name uh, Rangjun Tochi. And this story began with the death of the old Buddhist monk named Kamapakshi. His incarnation would be the, considered the first in Tibetan history. His uh, disciple first tried to collect all the declaration made by Kamapakshi. For example, he told a layman that he would be reborn as a dear children, a dear child. And this kind of privacy remained very 
important evidence for identifying Trungpa for the next 800 years. And regarding to the incarnation of Karmapa, this started the tradition of the older Karmapa leaving a writing privacy about how to find his incarnation, including the name of the future parent and the region where he will be reborn and the year of his birth and so on. So the next kind of evidence used to identify the incarnation of Kama Bhakshi was to investigate in the experience of his future mother. So what was her personal experience of conception, pregnancy, and childbirth. So the mother, Joma Yangjun, reported many vision and dream while pregnant. For example, according to a famous history called Scholar's Feast. So when Kama Bhakshi entered his mother's womb, Yangjun had a wonderful feeling and experienced joy day and night and a dream encounter with the saint. The mother said, <clears throat> family and local, you know, just community also experience vision and strong, a strange sign during the pregnancy. This very carefully documented and interpreted by disciple of the previous master Kama Bhakshi. And this practice of interpreting the experience of mother become a very important kind of evidence used to identify a thousand to go right now down to the today. So this is the thing. This the amazing sign continued after the child was born named Rangju Doji. And after his birth, yes, he cleaned his own face with his hand. And looking at the moon, the baby said, the baby said, there is a moon of the eighth day. So when his aunt witnessed this, she said, we should kill this baby because something is wrong. He's speaking just after he was born. However, the parent disagree. So when the baby was three years old, he asked his parent to make him a black hat. After that, he wore this black hat and sat on the stone throne and keep teaching about uh, Buddhism. So this teaching very little carefully recorded by his disciple as evidence that this was the unusual child who already familiar with complicated Buddhist philosophy without being thought. So this kind of unusual childhood behavior is still considered evident for identified Tuku in the world. So in you know, other kind of self statement by young children were also carefully documented and interpreted. For example, the child would identify himself by discussing the community of dead Kama Bhakshi. So once his mother was upset because of bad weather had destroyed her prayer flag pole, and the young boy said to her, if you have that much faith in a prayer flag pole, I will give you my huge prayer flag pole at Tsubu Monastery. You can see the picture and Tsubu Monastery found by the first Kamapa Chusun Kemba. So another time, his father developed greedy through about other people's sheep. The young incarnation know his father's thought and said to him, I have many more uh, flock of sheep and even bigger herd of horse in come. I will give all this to you. And his, his astonished father said, how did you know my mind? The young boy replied, I'm the Karmapa. The father then remembered that Karmapa had given a prophecy that he would be the father of his incarnation. So the father then posted to his own son with strong division. So examine this kind of unusual childhood speech become a standard way of identifying Tulku century after century. So for example, this is how many of Dalai Lama were identified. So 
other type of evidence from the child's unusual speech. You know, can one speak to the higher religion figure? For example, one of the biographers saying that when the boy was five years old, his parents took him to visit Uyemba. The night before they were going to meet, Uyemba dreamed that the karma arrived and told him, you should know I'm coming. So Uyemba woke up early in the morning and said to his disciple, last night, I dreamed that I saw the Kamamba and he told me he's, he's coming here. You know, after a few minutes, one of his disciples visited him and told him that last night I met a couple. They said, their son is Kamamba. And Ujimba replied, oh, this is the one. So Ujimba asked his monk to go get the boy and prepare welcoming for him. So Ujimba told his disciple, you should make a high throne that set above me. If this boy is a karmamba, he will set on it without fear. Once the young boy entered the monastery, he climbed up onto the throne without fear. So according to one text, Ujimba asked the young boy directly, are you the karmamba? The young boy replied, I'm well known as a karmamba. Then Uyemba also asked, do you remember what you give to me? The young boy answered, I give you my black hat and text. Uyemba said, oh, that is true. And he returned the black hat to him. The young boy put on black hat. And because of it, he was so small and the hat was too big, it made everyone laugh. So after wearing the hat, the young boy come down from the high throne and pay homage to the Ujemba. So while pay homage to Ujemba, the young boy said, even though I was your teacher, now you have to train me. Ujemba handed him a text and said, if you are real my Lama, he knew how to read, please read this to me. The young boy read the text immediately without any difficulty. Ujimba also asked the young boy when he was born. Ujimba also asked young boy when he was born. And then Ujimba said, there are only five months between my lamas passing and your births. Therefore, I do not think you are the bodily manifestation of my lama. The young boy replied, my consciousness entered into the fidu of woman who was already four months old. The Ujimba then asked, what else do you remember? The young boy replied, when I was inside my mother's womb, I could hear and see outside the womb. Ujimba said, can you prove it? The young boy said, when I was in my mother's womb, my mother told my father, this baby must be a girl because it will not stop moving. But father said to my mother that, this must be a boy because in my dream, I was told that a son will be arriving. So when Ujimba asks questions separated to the parent, they give the same answer as a young boy. So as a result of successfully passing all of these texts, which were mostly speech-based, everyone tells that this young boy was the incarnation of the true group of Kamapakshi. So from this, you know, 15 you know, further incarnations of Kamaba were identified over the last 700 years. And the Tulku tradition was born in Tibet. So all of this practice to uh, you know, interpret the speech and behavior of unusual children become widely used to identify other incarnation between 13th to 15th century. Time. Yeah, yeah. So before concluding, and uh, let me share one another short example. So in, in 1422, the first female incarnation were, was identified. This was the first Doji Pamu named Chugudumi, born in Western Tibet. So according to one earlier text, 
before the future incarnation enter her mother's womb, the mother dreamed that a naked conscious girl wearing a worn ornament appearing and asked her to provide the lodging. And <clears throat> her mother reported that dream to her husband and her husband said that you should ask a lama. She explained that dream to a lama and this lama prophesied that this is an early sign that a supreme tulku or reincarnation will appear. So at conception, the mother dream of the sun and moon dissolved into her heart. So, you know, when looking for the identified tulku, which usually mother's dreams is very important. And she also experienced great happiness in her body and mind and noticed an amazing aroma in the air. This sign were, this sign were taken seriously and a great local lama began offering the mother tantric initiation of Buddha or long life. So every day of her pregnancy, basically saying, while she pregnancy every day, he for this kind of initiation. Sorry to interrupt, um, there's five minutes left. Okay, thanks, yeah. <clears throat> and the, the birth of the unusual girl was announced in a dream by the, they call white horseman wearing a heart skirt. He told the mother, the day after tomorrow, an important guest will come in here. So you should prepare a vast, you know, feast gathering. He installed a prayer flag and offering banner on the top of the, her house and then vanished. So when she was eight months old, just before being taken to the receive a name from a great Lama, her daughter said her to mother, she said, my name is Quincho Chugi Gemo. She said, you should call me Quincho. Quincho means in Tibet language, which is rare and supreme. She said, you show me Quincho because I will hold the lineage of three jewels, three jewels, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. She said, which are very rare and supreme in this world. And she also said, you should call me the Chugi Gemo. Gemo in Tibetan Chugi means Dharma. Gemu means queen or victor. She said, you should call me the Chugi Gemu because I will attend the glory of the victor in the all direction. So when she was uh, taken to the great Lama, he decided to secretly give her the name she had given herself. So anyway, just uh, this is the first one. Then 11 further incarnations of the Samdhi Torji Pama were identified over the last and 600 years. So anyway, in Tibetan, so early is uh, male trigger lineage, as I mentioned earlier, Karmapa, currently 17. Earliest female trigger lineage, some the Toji Pama currents in 12. So uh, let me conclude my this presenting. So these are just two examples of the many dozen that my dissertation explored from the first period of this. So you can see here my just one by one. This is like a, from, it's, I do hold my chapter divide is five part. And the rest of my dissertation examine how this earlier practice of identifying the speech of special children were expanded as the institution grew. This including public examination, and blind testing of multiple candidate and divination of trans regional authority and of course official political practice such as the you know controversial golden uran which is system developed in the Qing period 1644 to 1911. So the identification of Tuku still organized the reproduction of religious, social, and political power in inner Asian community. And it is a major issue in the Tibetan and Chinese situation, such as who will have the authority to choose the next Dalai Lama and so on. 
and, and thanks so much. So that's all. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. I learned a lot that I'd never encountered before. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? So Jonathan asked a question in the chat. Um, after the Trilkas pass, pass away, does Tibetan religion believe that the Trilkas reincarnate as another being? If not, then what does the religion believe is slash are the fates after the Trilkas pass away? Uh, say again. So the, the, quest, the question is, after the Trilkus pass away, does Tibetan religion believe that the Trilkus reincarnate to another being? If not, then what does the religion believe is slash are the fates after the Trilkus pass away? Okay, so basically is saying is after Trilku pass away, we can just find another Trilku. Like for example, saying like, you know, second Dalai Lama is considered Trilku. Uh, after second Dalai Lama pass away, and we can choose the third Dalai Lama. So the main reason is like, uh, like for us, they say second Dalai Lama start one project. This project's incomplete. So third Dalai Lama continually carrying the previous Dalai Lama project and we just continue. So that's the idea. So, and yeah, of course, sometime and Turku pass away and for the, some special purpose, special reason, and just being born as another future as well, not necessarily human being. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Really interesting talk. And I, of course, know nothing about this, this area, but I was curious in terms of the, the spread of the practice. And was that just sort of a natural evolution or were there deliberate attempts to spread the the, the the practice geographically? Oh, that, that is, I mean, that's a really interesting question. So it's like basically seeing my research main thing first, like a period, or like evidence is basically child speaking. Child have unusual, even one year, a few months or one years old speaking. Then this practice, maybe we just like, a, you know, 100 years using this practice. Then another Turku, another Lama, they show us another special like a sign they can they, they, they are the Turku. So then everybody's, oh, this is also an unusual sign. Oh, then just like, so Bill just, it, they don't have a special chronicle like order. So, but different century and based on earliest practice and put develop new methods of identify. You know, just like uh, for example, saying like uh, we fifth Dalai Lama, we identified there's in Tibet, there's special organ leg, special leg, and lots of monks one there and special region for one week. And after one week, they can see the sign in the leg. This, this, the leg special very considered, you know, special leg. This kind of thing, different century and develop different, you know, it's such like a identification. Thank you. Thanks. Our next question comes from Oswald, who is asking is, is incarnation limited to humans only? Uh, is, in, in, say again, one more time. Is incarnation limited to humans only? Oh, not necessarily human only. Even looking for the, this is a Tibetan incarnation, the idea come from the Indian Jataka. So like life story Buddha. So even Buddha, so sometimes life story Buddha as a human being or sometimes as an animal. So not necessarily only like a human being. So even the Buddhist incarnation, sometimes must become as tree, a bridge, so whatever something necessary, Buddha or just Bodhisattva come as a as being or non-being. So not necessary human being. Thank you. Are there other questions? Oh, Jonathan again. Hey, Tempo. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I, I'm going to ask a very naive question because this is topic is completely new to me. Um, so I know that because for me, when I do a, a research, I, I do experiments and I like read 
papers and journals to, to like a little more about it. But in your field, like how exactly do you do research and like do you guys also publish like articles online as well just to, like to discuss your ideas with other scholars out there or how does that work? Okay, thanks so much. So Jonathan, same thing also like what <laughs> listening to your speech is very interesting, but I have no idea. <laughs> Just like we're completely different area, but anyway, just yeah, it's just like uh, I also, I think it's published two articles right now. I'm just processing, so like a scholarly way. So my research, you know, basically I'm reading the the Kontama history and autobiography. So this sort of thing, like maybe it's like you know, it's a 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century, and just this kind of, I'm reading. I want to say like uh, so far I did more than 300 autobiography for this my paper. So then among that I'm just looking for how they identify this tool group, how we prove this a tool group. So this got me all evident bring. Then I just make a summary, just saying okay. So in 13th century all the tools using this method, and 14th century based on that method they use another method, and 15th century another one. This kind of build up, yes. So that's what I'm saying thing, like for us, I'm saying, you know, this is a 14th Dalai Lama and the one 15th Dalai Lama coming and like for us, the Chinese governments, they have a kind of authority to identify 15th Dalai Lama and Tibetans say, no, we are the authority to 15th, identify 15th Dalai Lama. So it's my one, I'm not looking for the 20th century, early this research and people look at that and then just like uh, see who have uh, authority, this kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you for that. Thanks. Yeah. Of course. Thank you very much, Kenbo. That's the uh, the end of this section of our uh, senior doctoral fellows talk today. Uh, I'm going to invite Miriam Lowe to uh, join us to introduce Huda Hassan on behalf of African Studies. Thanks so much. Hello. Um, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff, and congratulations to all the previous presenters. I am absolutely delighted to introduce uh, Hoda Hassan, uh, the African Studies uh, Senior Doctoral Fellow for this year. Uh, Hoda Hassan is a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto's Women and Gender Studies Institute. Her research fields are Black Diaspora Cultural Studies, Black Transnational Feminism, and Media Studies. She has a BA in African Studies, Philosophy, and Political Science from the University of Toronto, and an MA from York University in Humanities. Has, uh, Hoda Hassan's dissertation is a Black Diaspora Cultural Studies project examining the constructions of Somalis in settler state media as criminal and the responses of Somali artists through self-creation, self-representation, and artistic placemaking. Her research interrogates broadly the constructions of criminality, race, ethnicity, religion, and nationalism in, Canad in Canadian news media reporting, and the contributions of Somalis to the aesthetic, semantics, and movements of contemporary Black diasporic art. Uh, Hassan is a writer, journalist, and critique from Scarborough and has been widely published in Pitchfork, Paper Magazine, has lit Quill and Choir, the Fader, Crawler, Fizzbed, um, Buzz, BuzzFeed, and the National Post. Uh, Hassan has appeared as a cultural critique at Toronto International Film Festival, Koffler Center for the Arts, Women's Health Center, McGill University, CBC's Metro Morning and The Current, as well as CTV's Culture Shop and Pop Life and more. So, uh, um, Huda, welcome and so delighted to hear uh, your talk today, uh, I will let you pronounce it, Shiaf Bara, Fictions, Empire, Tell, and Counter-Narratives of Somali Artists in Diaspora. We're very delighted to have you here today and looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Miriam Lowe. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, New College and New College Department, um, uh, also Dr. Miriam Lowe and the African Studies Department for accepting me as the New College Doctor of Fellow for this year. Uh, specifically for the African Studies stream. It's been very rewarding to return back to my alma mater uh, in my final year of my education. So I'm really grateful for that. <laughs> Glad to have you. <laughs> okay, so uh, for today's presentation, I will be um, 
briefly presenting uh, my doctoral work uh, or where it's currently at. Uh, think, uh, uh, it, 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 well, because of the past year, I guess, of the pandemic. Uh, so my project, my current project title or the working title is Iyal Baraf. So the C is silent, uh, typically for most Somali words. Uh, and Iyal Baraf is Somali for uh, children of the snow. So it is a reference to um, this being a work about uh, a work of Somali studies, uh, specifically focusing on Somali people living in diaspora. Oh, just, uh, can everyone see the presentation okay? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so Iyal Baraf, uh, meaning Children of the Snow, uh, is a Black diaspora cultural studies project that examines the framing and reproducing of a particular other in service of colonial attitudes and fictions of the empire. Uh, Iyal Baraf explores the ways in which Canada's Somali diaspora has been framed in mass media as the new national criminal subject. Focusing on Somalis in Toronto, I interrogate through this project the contemporary uh, mass, mediated, mass mediated constructions of Somali people in popular discourse and news reports through qual qualitative methods for the first part of this project. So there's two working project, uh, parts for this project. Uh, so for the first part, I examine how Somalis as a Black African Muslim demographic are repetitively framed as criminals in Canada as a settler state, how these constructs operate as a fiction of empire, what these constructions mean and whether they contribute to the exclusion of Somalis from the imagined political and moral communities of the nation. The second part of this project examines counter narratives of Somalis through Toronto cultural production, uh, where I examine lyrics, sounds, images, and aesthetics of Somali diasporic rappers, artists, and poets um, across uh, the country, uh, specifically in Toronto, though. Uh, wait, uh, I did add a quick note on this actually. So for my project title, I use the Somali phrase Yal Baraf, which means children of the snow, which I've said a few times in Somali, um, as an entry point into Somali studies diasporic scholarship. The phrase uh, is something that I heard oftentimes growing up. I was born and raised in Toronto, um, but most of my family lives in Somalia. I continue, continuously vi visit Somalia. And the phrase Yal Baraf was often used by elders or community members who were either living back home or who uh, were born and raised back home and now are living in diaspora to refer to community members such as myself who are products of elsewhere. So it's a way of not othering, but in the sense of saying you are a product of something different than we are. So uh, the Somalis and a lot of the phrases that we use can be oftentimes quite literal. So the othering that's happening here is saying that you are a product of elsewhere, specifically colder climates that are opposite and foreign to Somali people, Somali temperatures, Somali, uh, our land and our ancestry. So Yal Baraf refers to the new wave of Somalis in diaspora born overseas in, met in metropolitans colder than their roots. Uh, so in Canada, the US, London, Norway, Finland, and other colder climates who are crafting new languages and identities uh, for themselves. So uh, I just want to provide some quick notes on my fields and theoretical frameworks. Um, Black diaspora cultural studies, uh, Somali studies, and Black transnational feminisms are the primary fields guiding me through this work. Uh, Somali studies in Canada, as a growing field, has explored a wide array of topics, such as settlement experiences of East Africans, resistance strategies by Somali women in their day-to-day -day lives, the impact of Canadian nationalism on Somalis in school, the social cultural uh, adaptation of Somali refugees in Toronto, and the impact of Canadian policy policies on Somali refugee women, specifically experiences of settling in Canada after fleeing from the Civil War in Somalia, which took place in uh, 1987 to 1991. There is yet to be any scholarship on constructions of Somalis in Canadian news media or the criminalization of this demographic as Black, Muslim, and refugee. We do see that there is some scholarship analyzing the criminalization of Somalis as, as Muslim, uh, but not with all of these identities working in concert with each other. So uh, my work contributes to these existing gaps in Somali studies. Through my work, I am also thinking through a Black cultural studies framework. I am thinking about the Black African diaspora through Paul Gilroy Ship as a metaphor for the Black Atlantic uh, and Bernalda Walcott's conception of jogging as a metaphor characterizing the back and forth movement of Black, black Canada as an, as an articulation of Black diaspora. Um, as a location between the US, the Caribbean and Africa, Canada remains a bubbling brew of desires for elsewhere. 
And Somalis as a Black Muslim demographic in the Sulkis offer an analysis of the ways in which colonialism, imperialism, anti-Blackness, Islamophobia, and xenophobia is deeply intertwined in the experiences of the Black diaspora. Uh, my work contributes to conversations in Canada about Black diaspora, uh, drawing upon M. Norbis, M. Norbisi Phillips' Afrospora, George Elliott Clark's Africadia, and uh, Dion Brand's Freezing of Blacks in the Diaspora. Sorry, I'm just turning off my fan here. Uh, so in 2001, in her book, A Map to the Door of No Return, uh, Dion Brand wrote, to live in the Black diaspora is, I think, to live as a fiction, a creation of empires and also self-creation. This project considers what it means to live as a fiction for Somali diasporic youth in the creation of empires, as well as what self-creation means in this process. Uh, my scholarship uh, and thinking through nationalism, borders, diaspora, gender, and identity is continuously framed through a Black and transnational feminist framework. Uh, transnational, uh, black and transnational feminisms evoke here a confrontation of histories and contemporary imperialism colonialism and nationalism and shaping discourses, discourses around Somalis and diaspora. Uh, so in 1997, uh, Jackie Alexander and Chandra Mahanti helped us understand that local and global forms of domination continuously constitute one another and deconstruct the processes of imperialism and colonialism. And it is this framework that provides a position from which to argue for a comparative relational feminist praxis that is transnational in its response to and engagement with global processes of colonization. So for the, fast, uh, for the last five years of my doctoral work, I have arrived at uh, this research, research with deep reflection on the current transnationality of feminist scholarship and praxis and existing uh, power imbalances between the researcher and the researched. Uh, as a Somali woman in the diaspora who is a Western trained scholar, I occupy both an insider and outsider position to my work. My positionality offers a level of analysis, dedication, and understanding that is important to the completion of this project. It gives me the necessary critical lens to approach this work with uh, work deeply informed about these com the communities that I'm writing about as a member of the, com of the community I'm writing about. Uh, both my personal and professional experiences as a journalist and a critic, uh, alongside my own memories, um, actively inform the work that I'm conducting here. This is why my methods have deeply shifted uh, with considerations of COVID. Before COVID, uh, or before last, last, what was it? I guess it was March, last March, um, I intended to utilize field-based in-depth narrative interviews in order to decenter my own voice and, uh, my, and uh, my own voice and my analysis from dominating the results of this project. Initially, the study was intended to exist as a comparative analysis between Canada and Norway. Um, and I intended to embark on the study through semi-structured in-depth interviews with young Somalis between the ages of 19 and 29, in order to analyze how Somali artists living in Oslo, Norway and Toronto, Canada are engaging with mass-mediated mass -mediated constructions of their communities in their day-to-day -day lives alongside how they reflect on these constructions of their artistic works. Uh, transitioning field work and personal conversations with particularly vulnerable community members to Zoom uh, radically disrupts safety and trust for participants, particularly young Black people who are talking about criminality, which is why uh, I decided not to move forward with field work. Um, I decided to accept that field work is a possibility that can um, happen in the future. I just did not feel ethically um, aligned or uh, okay with moving forward with uh, talking with young Somali people from particularly vulnerable locations about the ways in which they have a relationship with uh, being criminalized by the state. Uh, my intent as a researcher is to build a safe space for these conversations and I hope to do so in the future. To continue on with this work, I uh, relied on content, visual, uh, semiotic and discourse analysis as qualitative research techniques, which allowed me to examine the ways in which Somalis have been constructed as criminal uh, or criminals through different mediums. So through these methods, I analyze word frequencies, images, concepts, premises, and the frameworks that are used to represent, uh, interpret, understand, and make sense of Somalis in Canada through mass media. Stuart Hall's use of conjunctural analysis, uh, which is my second point there, uh, is, a black, is a Black cultural studies methodology and a Marxist science of politics as per Lenin's current moment. 
is uh, most useful to my work here. It's influenced by the theoretical contributions of Gramsci and Althusser. Um, a conjuncture for Hall is a moment of intervention, but also a moment of danger. It is a call to intellectual, social, cultural, and political action. Uh, conjunctural analysis is not a theory per se, uh, as per Hall, but an analytical tool to explore the multiplicity of forces or antagonisms in any given crisis. So conjuncture moves away from the idea of a singular crisis or a singular antagonism or a singular force, and it instead examines the different key practices and sites in a social formation that can join and come together in the same moment, political space, uh, or fuse in a ruptural unity. So I just wanted to give a brief overview of some of the chapters that I am in the midst of working on. Um, the first, well, well, actually, before I get there, the, as I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, there are two parts to this presentation, uh, which the first is uh, viewing or analyzing the ways that Somalis are constructed in media. Uh, so how they are presented as fictions or creations of empires. And the second part of the project is looking at um, how the counter narratives, how Somalis are uh, constructing themselves. So for the first part of this pro uh, project, uh, the first chapter of this part is called the Somalization of Crime. So for this chapter, I trace the historic relationship between news media, black corporate politics, and the legacy of the post-slavery post subject in a post 9-11 moment. I examine mainstream's, uh, mainstream media's framing and circulation of uh, Somalis as the nation's latest and ongoing criminal trope, um, as the innately violent and a threat to Canadian nationalisms. Tracing the genesis of the black criminal phenomenon, I consider here the genealogies of global post-slavery modernity, colonialism, and history of overseas imperial interventions against economic and military rival states. What are the larger functions of framing the Somali black Muslim as criminal here? Uh, understanding news media as public discourse, this chapter utilizes media content analysis to examine the language used to construct Somalis as Canada's latest black criminal trope through reports on Rob Ford's substance use in 2013. Uh, a global moment in Toronto politics that I argue had an undercurrent of framing Toronto's Somali community as responsible for the city's growing drug trade problem. In this chapter, I trace the criminalization of Somalis in Canadian news media with a focus on 2010 to 2016. Uh, this paper builds off of the work of Dr. Aqua Benjamin, who teaches at Ryerson University, and her work uh, regarding the criminalization of Canada's Jamaican diaspora through the 1990s and early 2000s. I demonstrate in this chapter how the Somalization of crime reveals ongoing re reproductions of race, gender, belonging, and Canadian nationalisms. I also urge a questioning of the function and the ethics of identification in journalistic practices and examine the ethics of the contemporary journalist. So largely, uh, what is the point or the purpose of using ethnic identifiers in the process of reporting on crime in Toronto or in, Cana uh, in Canadian news media? Some of my larger questions here are what are the fictions that empires create of the Black Muslim diaspora to create uh, or to reframe social and historical processes of colonization and imperialism. What is being articulated about nationalism, belonging, multiculturalism, and identity through current constructions of Somalis in Toronto and Canada. For my second chapter, um, uh, it's a bit of a split title, How We're Mourned or How We Mourn. Uh, this, this chapter is a comparative analysis between um, the reportings of two uh, individuals, two Somali community members who were killed in recent years. Uh, the first is Sumaya Damar, who's on the left. Uh, she was a 26-year-old activist and model from Toronto, uh, and she was also an, an adored and familiar face in Toronto's Somali queer and trans communities. Uh, according to Toronto Police Services and reports, on February 22nd, 2015, uh, Toronto Police Services from the 55 Division were called to Samaya's home in the east end of Toronto, where she was pronounced dead at the scene. According to police, the results of her autopsy were allegedly inconclusive. They didn't find any evidence to indicate that the death was suspicious. According to reported community accounts, however, Samaya disappeared on the weekend of February 21st to the 22nd, uh, and she was last being seen uh, chased by a man uh, in her home neighborhood. This led friends, family, and community members to believe that her death was a homicide and demanded an investigation. 
uh, Samaya's death was the result of an epidemic of structural gendered violence targeted towards Black trans women in North America. Two years later, in the summer of 2016, Abdurrahman Abdi was killed uh, during an early morning interaction with Ottawa police and his lifeless body was left on display in the streets of Canada's capital after it was re recorded and broadcast broadcasted across national uh, newspapers. This case led to a trial against two Ottawa police officers, which was the second time in Canadian history that on-duty officers were charged with the death of civilians uh, suffering from mental illness. The trial concluded uh, not too long ago that Ottawa police officer Daniel Matsian was found not guilty on all charges of the death of Abdurrahman Abdi. So this chapter analyzes uh, these two cases to answer larger questions on the purpose of criminalizing Black Muslims, uh, specifically Black Muslim refugees, to discourses of race, criminality, and power in the Canadian political, socioeconomic, and cultural imaginary. I utilize media content analysis here in my comparative analysis as to how Samea Damar's death was reported on versus Abdurrahman Abdi's. And there are very uh, drastic differences on whose death was reported on and whose was overlooked. I argue that these two cases reveal the hypervisibility of criminalizing Black masculinity and the invisible hypercriminalization of black, uh, black femininity. There's a particular erasure of how Black women are criminalized in Black liberation discourse. And as we see with the case of Samea Damar, this process exasperates uh, when it comes to sex workers and Black women with trans experience. Uh, in essence, or in summary, this chapter um, explores what type of Black death makes it to the news. Mm -hmm. So now moving on to the second part of this project where I'm, uh, the first part again, like I said, was focusing on the constructions of Somalis and settler state media. Uh, and this part of the project, the second part, focuses on how Somalis are constructing ourselves. So uh, my third chapter is called, is loosely called right now, I, I change it every day, uh, Somali rappers, uh, black culture and the chain of disappearance. This chapter is concerned with self-creation, self-representation, and placemaking through Somali art making and diaspora, with a focus on rappers from Toronto. I consider the evocations of race, gender, religion, criminality, and nationalism through the Somali rapper. Uh, and thinking through the social constructions of Black criminality and Black pathology, I focus on the collaborations and tensions between Toronto rapper Drake and Somali rappers from various poor neighborhoods, uh, specifically Regent Park and Jungle. And you can see some artists on display here, Mustafa the Poet, who's a rising artist from Regent Park, um, and a lot of his peers, uh, are, who are some of the, I would say, more prominent artists coming out of the city right now. Uh, Somali artists who are contributing to the aesthetic, semantic sounds and writings of Black culture in Toronto are also framed outside of a particular authentic Blackness. This chain of disappearance or exploitation of memory, I argue, uh, of the cultural contributions of one of Canada's most hyper-visible demographic, demographics is my focus in this chapter. I examine how Somalis inscribe themselves and reinvent their narratives through, uh, reinvent the narratives of, of themselves through Toronto cultural production to move this project away from focusing solely on a discourse on how Somalis are articulated on in media, providing a more complex analysis of Black performativity and therefore Black political identifications. Uh, in this chapter, Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, five minutes? No, no, no. Sorry, I missed the five minutes mark. Uh, oh, <laughs> you know, two, two minutes because we, we have minutes? time for a conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll zoom through. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, examine here the framing of Somalis as criminals in, uh, and how uh, Somalis are framed as a criminal in the work of Drake, while the contributions of Somali artists and creatives are also made as uh, made in, rendered invisible. Um, specifically, I'm, I'm arguing how the Somali is deployed as a Black working class, working class or poor demographic in the eyes of Drake uh, in his hyper-masculine desires to demonstrate himself uh, as authentically Black. And my last chapter, uh, I'm thinking about Audre Lorde. Um, in, in, in her work, uh, Audre Lorde's poetry is not a luxury. She locates poetry as an essence of femininity when she plays with Descartes' infamous skeptical phrase, uh, uh, I, I think therefore I am, uh, which she rephrases to, I feel therefore I can be free. Uh, Lord helps us locate freedom as within and poetry as a tool to make it real. And the ways a Somali woman loves considers the feminist responses of Somali women to patriarchy and colonialism through different modes of poetry. 
I'm thinking about Lord's uh, erotic as a method through this paper, which uh, when she writes that the erotic is a source or resource within each of us that lies in a deeply female and spiritual plane, firmly rooted in the power of our unexpressed or unrecognized feeling. Through this chapter, uh, I'm thinking about Audre Lorde, Amy Cesar, uh, Somali studies scholar Saeed Sheikh Samatar, to examine the function of poetry as a tool of resistance against colonialism and patriarchy by Somali women. Uh, oral poetry was once a private practice for women in colonial Somalia that transitioned into a public tradition as Somali women moved their way through diaspora. I examine through this chapter relational themes such as resistance, power, anti-colonial thought, and Black feminist thoughts in the uh, poetic contributions of Ifra Hussein, who was a local poet uh, from Regent Park, as well as Warsan Shire from London, England. And I argue here that uh, Somali women demonstrate how poetry as a vehicle between the ontological and epistemological can assist us to tap into our inner erotic or freedom. This chapter explores how Somali women have exercised this through oral, oral poetry uh, from resistance struggles back home to abroad. Mm -hmm. Okay. To, oh, I think should I stop? <laughs> Q&A, perhaps one minute briefly on the current result and contributions. Yeah. Oh, sorry, what was that? Uh, perhaps one minute briefly, just to- Oh, yes, yeah. So I argue in this project that the framing of Black diasporas as an imported crime through media tropes uh, contributes to the national narrative that criminality in Canada always arrives here and is never ever produced here or uh, developed here. So the Black criminal trope functions and to conceal and distract the general public from the ongoing violences of settler colonialism to both Black and Indigenous communities here. E.L. Butterf also offers an archive and cultural mapping of African Black uh, African Black uh, Muslim sounds, aesthetics, semantics, and movements. It demonstrates how Somalis have contributed significantly to Black diaspora culture production locally and globally. Lastly, Yael Butaf offers an archive of the theoretical contributions of contemporary Somali studies scholars, particularly scholarship produced concerning Somalia's diaspora. And this is just a playlist that I'm sharing uh, if you want to ever work through or hear some of the artists that I'm studying or analyzing. It's a collection of Somali artists from across the world, across the globe, uh, and also across genres from rap, R&B, blues, folk, electronic, whatever genre you can think of. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Hoda, for this uh, insightful and uh, very rigorous presentation. And I, I think uh, we, can, um, we can have a few minutes of conversation. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, I'm checking the chat, but I haven't seen any. Oh yeah, there's one, one question. Uh, you can check, uh, given the current issues of race that plague society, if you were to give one piece of advice to government leaders, what would that be and why? And that's from Jonathan Chio, one of your co-presenters. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm just gonna reread it again. Given the current issues of race that plague society, if you were to give one piece of advice to government leaders, what would that be and why? Ooh. Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is that the history is present. Um, the history is always in continuum. It's uh, never past or a prior, a prior, uh, like it's, it's always in continuum. So I, I would, I think the first thing I would say is how does the, how does history continuously inform the present? So how does us living on settler colonial land, land that was stolen by indigenous people, land where uh, the, slave tr the slave trade was a very important process to the cultivation of labor here and, and, and cultivating this empire, how does the past inform the present and how does that continuously shape Black experiences here? I'm a Somali woman who, uh, I am part of the Black diaspora, someone who lives here, but my people have only come here in the past 30 years and we have entered into a history that isn't ours, but also is ours, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Any other questions? I would, uh, I'll take my privilege to ask you this question first. I really enjoy um, both, you know, the, uh, the, the depth of the analysis and the aesthetic in the presentation as well. So, uh, but uh, the question I have is, you know, how do you, where do you see the sites of agency uh, in cultural production? I think you, you really mm -hmm. trying to counterbalance the, um, dominant narrative of criminality uh, um, and you know self-representation as agentic. Uh, so I think this is really a powerful juxtaposition and, and very agentic. Um, can you expand a little bit about the different artists 
and the tools and strategies for agency and to, they are employing uh, through cultural productions uh, to resist uh, these troops and these um, forms of othering in the media. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. <laughs> Thank you, Miriam. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's one that I'm still trying to answer myself. In one of the chapters that I uh, explained, I, tr I talked about uh, one of the conclusions I'm trying to arrive at is what is the ethics of the journalists? What is your, what, how should you move forward in, in reporting on communities ethically? And I think I'm trying to take that same, same question to the artist. How can, how can you move forward ethically um, uh, I guess representing your community that, that's that's a very daunting task and I don't think that every artist who contributes to cultural production wants to take on that task of representing their community but that is something that is fallen upon them because of the limited narratives from our own perspectives that exist in, in mass media. Um, I don't know if this fully answers the question uh, but there's one artist I already mentioned um, Mustafa the Poet, whose work has been coming out recently, his album's about to come out this week, and I've been listening to him a lot. He's not necessarily part of the Somali diaspora, but I do study him in this work because he's Sudanese. He is not far from our identities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he also grew up a around a large Somali presence and refers to that in his work. Uh, there's, there's this way that he, there's a song that he released today uh, called The Hearse, which is a, a, in reference to the grieving process, so carrying going to the funeral, the, the, the feeling of going to the funeral when you've lost a family member or a community member. And in that song, you hear uh, samples of Sudanese war songs from decades ago that sound so casual, you don't really catch it, but I was able to catch it and ask him, inquire a little bit more about that. But I think that that to me is a sample of the subtle ways in which our agency comes into our music, the way that that, that, that his history and um, there's something larger going on there that is so subtle that I don't th think the common ear can locate it, but his community can, his family can. Um, I don't, yeah. Excellent. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, is, uh, powerful, yeah. Uh, anybody else has um, questions for uh, Huda? Perhaps one final comment. Uh, where do you see journalists um, moving forward and learning from these past, you know, uh, reification and criminalization of diasporic communities? Because mm -hmm. it was done against the Jamaican, now it's done against the uh, Somali. So what's, what are the ethical commitments for journalists to actually refrain from reproducing these negative and damaging mm -hmm. tropes on particular racialized immigrant communities? Yeah, I think it's it's an ongoing process that we won't see. I think there's improvements that we're seeing in many ways. Even this year, with uh, in recent in recent weeks, um, there's been a lot of discourse about the reporting of Israel and Palestine and the conflicts going on there. Um, and I think the difficulty that happens in journalism, which happens in many other fields, is this imposition or uh, uh, this this idea of objectivity. Mm -hmm. objectivity as uh, always the goal of arrival but the process of objectivity erases and um, is actually very violent in many ways in that, in that in the process so I think there's this, I think journalism is in this very confused confusing place right now uh, where the, the ethics of the journalist is con continuously being questioned but also the audience and the ways in which the, the platform and, uh, that that journalists now can re resort to to share stories right we definitely live in an age where there's an, an, an anti-intellectualism happening right now, an attack on uh, mainstream journalism. We cannot access a lot of uh, traditional news media websites right now for free. Uh, we, I, can't, I can't read the Toronto Star for free or the Globe and Mail or the National Post. <laughs> and for those who can't afford to read these very important publications for us to receive news and information about what's happening in the worlds that we live in, uh, there is this turn to independent publications that I've been noticing that's been happening more. And I think that turn to independent publications is allowing people to play with uh, how ethical the journalist can, can be or how further, further ethical the journalist can, can go. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. On that note, I just want to thank Huda for this very sort of provoking, excellent and really uh, amazing talk. And uh, just thank also all the previous presenters for your 
you know, thoughtful reflections on your work. So I'll turn it to Jeff. I think if he has some final words for all our presenters, but congratulations on your stellar work. It's been uh, very refreshing to learn from your respective work and to Huda, you know, amazing work. I look forward to, you know, uh, the full dissertation when it's done. And, uh, but it's truly an intervention in so many fields. Thank you so much. So, uh, you. and to all the audience, thank you for tuning in. Jeff, I'll leave you the final word. Thank you very much, Marianne. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you to all of our speakers and to everyone who came uh, to hear them today. I think we've had this, this rare combination of seeing human beings as biological entities, as spiritual entities, as cultural and political entities, and we've kind of had a whole human experience today. And I think that is, is very uh, a wonderful way to finish off this series. Um, all of them were thought provoking. I, I for one learned just an immense amount of things today. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers for bringing everything that they brought and for bringing their whole selves uh, <laughs> into this. I think it's, it's, yeah. it's hard to do, it's challenging to do. Um, so thank you so much and best wishes uh, for the rest of your studies, um, for when you do finally become the doctor you are seeking to be and uh, for when all the hard work that you're doing pays off in the ways that you're striving for. I think these are, are wonderful things that you're all engaged in. And I, I'm sure that everyone else enjoyed them as much as I did today. So thank yes. you very much to all of you. And thanks to everyone who made the series possible, the hard work behind the posters, the timing, the Zoom. So thank you all. And I think Tara is not here today, uh, but uh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Nancy, everyone. And uh, thank you to our presenters for sharing your work with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye. Congratulations, everyone. Bye. Well done. Congratulations. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>